After watching this video lecture, students are going to be able to differentiate between endo and exothermic processes. Uh, you'll be able to identify the components of a reaction progression diagram um, and determine if the reaction is endo or exothermic. We'll discuss calorimetry um, and how to use the information provided from a calorimeter to calculate and figure out information about reactions. Um, and lastly, we'll relate our heat of our reaction, or our Q of reaction, to um, the enthalpy of reaction. So let's go ahead and let's look at the first law of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics states that the energy in the universe is constant. So energy is not being created or it's not being destroyed. Um, instead, it's just being converted into one form or the other. Um, and typically, the way that we analyze it in uh, chemistry class is that we will look at, you know, heat transfers or work performed. Um, and these are means to analyze uh, the transfer of energy between your system and your surroundings. Now, the system is going to be the substance or the process that we're studying. So, like, molecules coming together to form new products or an object gaining or losing heat. These are things that we may have questions about or maybe trying to gain information about. Um, the surroundings are going to be everything around the system. So, the thermometer you're taking the temperature with... Um, the container that the reaction mixture is in, you know, the air surrounding it. Technically, you are part of the surroundings. Okay, so um, now that we kind of understand our system and our surroundings and the fact that there's going to be um, transfer of energy, let's go ahead and look at some more details. So we're going to go ahead and look at reaction progression diagrams and how they relate to um, that exchange of energy. So remember, energy is neither created nor destroyed. Um, it's just converted from one form into the other. So if you look at this first reaction progression diagram, you notice on the y-axis we have energy, on the x-axis we have the progress of reaction, or, you know, reaction time is another thing we could put there. Okay, and I also want you to notice that we have a line that's representing reactants, a line that's representing products. And in this case, the reactants here have a higher energy value than the products. So when this reaction goes from reactants to products, energy is being lost, okay? Now, in most reactions um, that we're going to be observing, we're going to be talking about the heat energy that is gained or lost, okay? So when reactants go to products here, energy is being lost, and energy is going to be being lost in the form of heat, okay? And so when we go from higher energy reactants to lower energy products, products, energy is lost um, in the system, okay, and that energy is lost as heat, okay, so this is an exothermic reaction, the reaction is downhill, and the energy that's going to be released um, is going to be represented um, by a negative Q value. Now Q, as we know, represents heat, Okay, um, and this negative sign here tells us that that heat energy is being released from the system. Okay, um, on the other end of that, we have another reaction progression um, diagram here. We have reactants at lower energy and products at higher energy. So in this case, energy is being absorbed. Um, and so the heat energy is going to be picked up by the reactants as it's converted into products. And we subsequently have an uphill reaction, this endothermic process. Okay, absorbing of heat is what's happening, and we're going from lower energy reactants to higher energy products. And in this situation, okay, we are representing um, our Q value as being positive because the system is gaining heat. So here's a little bit more detailed um, reaction progression diagram. Uh, once again, we have our energy and our reaction progress. We have our reactants and our products. Okay, but obviously we have a few more labels here. This first one here, Okay, this first label here is your activation energy. Your activation energy um, is going to basically represent the amount of energy needed um, uh, for the reaction to progress. Okay, so um, as reactants are floating around and running into each other, um, they have to have the correct energy and the correct orientation in order to form new bonds um, and break old ones. Okay, and so your activation energy is going to be that energy required. And so as particles are floating around and flying around in a container, you know, they have various levels of energy. Um, and when those particles slam together with the correct energy value, um, they've reached their activation energy requirement and subsequently will go into the product's form. The other new thing that we're seeing here on this uh, reaction progression diagram um, is the change in enthalpy. Okay, so enthalpy is basically the total energy um, in a system or the 
the internal energy. Um, and, and the delta H here, or the change, is representing the difference or the overall change that occurs when we go from reactants to products. Okay, and if you notice here, you're taking the difference in energy between reactants minus the different energy of products. Um, so in this case, because the exchange is happening via heat transfer, um, this is also going to represent the heat that has been lost. Okay, um, and so your overall change in your enthalpy here is represented, your activation energy, and of course the typical pieces that we've already seen in the reaction progression diagram. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's talk about calorimeters and calorimetry. So first of all, a calorimeter is a device that's going to be used or is used to measure the heat released or sometimes absorbed by physical or chemical processes. Okay, and calorimeters um, are going to either have two forms. Um, either they're going to be constant pressure, pressure calorimeters um, or coffee cup calorimeters. These are open to um, the atmosphere, um, so uh, they are occurring at constant pressure. Um, or you have these very expensive bomb calorimeters, which are constant volume calorimeters. And these are um, much more complicated and obviously expensive pieces of equipment. Um, so we are not actually going to be discussing these. Um, we'll talk about those in AP chemistry. But uh, we're going to go ahead and look at constant pressure calorimetry um, in great detail. Okay, so the constant pressure calorimeter, or the coffee cup calorimeter as it's sometimes called, is going to consist of several parts. First of all, we have styrofoam cups and a, and a lid. These are all intended uh, to help keep the uh, situation that we have inside um, insulated. Okay, so we want to make sure that heat transfer is occurring mainly between uh, the reaction particles that are inside the solution and, of course, the solution um, surrounding it. Okay, um, that then allows us to um, get the maximum heat transfer between the things that are um, being wanting to be studied and the things that are actually directly being observed. Okay, now your thermometer um, is going to be stuck into that solution. It's going to be part of your surroundings. Um, and it's going to subsequently monitor the change in temperature of the surroundings. Okay, and then sometimes we'll have a stir um, to kind of help make sure we move around um, some of the reaction um, particles so that, you know, they can interact more easily and the reaction can occur. Okay, um, now, what's the point of coffee cup calorimetry? Okay, well, the coffee cup calorimeter is going to allow you to analyze the surroundings. Okay, so again, guys, the thermometer, the cups, okay, um, even the liquid that the reaction is sitting in are all surroundings. Okay, so we're able to get ourselves information about the surroundings. We're able to get the temperature. We could figure out the volume and subsequent mass of the liquid. Um, and obviously, if we know what the liquid is, we can know the specific heat capacity. And in that factor, in that situation, we can figure out our Q of solution or our Q of our water, if that's all that's in the container. Okay, um, and so what we can do is find information out about the surroundings. Okay, so we're going to measure the surroundings directly. And because energy is neither created or destroyed, it's just transferred, we can use these relationships in order to figure out specific information about our system. Okay, so um, we're going to directly measure our surroundings and then use this relationship related to the first law of thermodynamics to get information about the system. Okay, and also because we are running uh, coffee cup calorimeters that are um, open to the atmosphere and are existing or occurring at constant pressure, um, your Q of your reaction process is going to be equal to your enthalpy of your reaction, right? So heat transfer is what we're focusing on. Remember, delta H is representative of the total energy or internal energy of the system, okay? Um, and you subsequently can use this relationship because uh, you're at constant pressure. So let's go ahead and let's apply this. So we have our Q of solution is equal to our negative Q of reaction. Okay, remember our solution is going to be the thing that we are directly measuring. Okay, and it is going to consist of your surroundings. And then your Q of reaction is the thing you're trying to study. Okay, it's indirect. Okay, and this is your system. So when we're doing our calculations for calorimetry problems, the first thing we're going to do is get our information about our solution. So we know that Q of solution is equal to 
mass of the solution times C of the solution times delta T of the solution. Okay, so um, the mass of the solution can be figured out um, whether you weigh the liquid that you put in your calorimeter, right? So whether I know the mass because I weighed it or because I used the density, I can figure out the mass of my solution, okay? The specific heat capacity of my solution, um, if it's water um, or any dilute solution, it's going to be 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, okay? Um, and then we're gonna get our delta T by calculating the temperature final minus temperature initial, okay? Now, once we get all of this information about our solution, we can calculate Q of solution. And remember, Q of solution is the surroundings, right? But I'm not asking for information about how the surroundings are changed. I wanna know how my reaction or the thing that I'm studying is changing. Okay, so once I get my Q of solution, I can subsequently use this relationship, which I'm actually gonna show, right? Okay, and my Q of reaction is gonna be therefore equal to some um, negative or opposite sign U of whatever I have calculated um, above. Okay, so um, additionally, because I know my Q of reaction, I can find out my enthalpy of reaction through this relationship, okay? And delta H of reaction is gonna equal that value as well. Okay, guys, now when you're doing your calculations, you need to make sure you show um, these relationships. You can't just change the sign randomly. You have to make sure that you're um, indicating, okay? So let's go ahead and let's do practice. Okay, so let's do this calorimetry problem. Okay, so we have a 25.64 gram sample um, of a solid that has been heated to 100 degrees C. It is then placed in our coffee cup calorimeter, okay, that has a 50 gram sample of water already in it. Now, we also have a thermometer set up. So we initially had a temperature value of 25.10 degrees C in our water sample, okay? And then after we added that solid, it increased to 28.49 degrees C. And what they want us to do is use the information we have obtained from um, the change in our water to figure out the specific heat capacity of the solid. So the first thing we wanna do is break down all the variables we have for our um, system versus our surroundings. So remember, we have Q of our um, solution equals negative Q of reaction. Um, remember, in this case, we're talking about surroundings versus system. Right, so thing we're, thing we're measuring, thing we're trying to get information about. Okay, so in this case, it might be more appropriate or easier for us to keep track of um, the system and the surroundings if we label it as the following, right? So this is the surroundings, okay? And this is the system, okay? So we need information about our Q of H2O so that we can then calculate things for our Q of our solid. So for Q of H2O, Right, we're gonna need the mass of H2O, the specific heat capacity of H2O, and the change in temperature of H2O. Okay, so our mass of H2O, they provided that to us. We're gonna write out that variable, so 50.00 grams, and I want you guys doing the same thing. Okay, um, our C of H2O um, is this 4.184. Okay, you guys need to memorize that. So 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin or degree Celsius, it doesn't really matter. And then our delta T of our H2O is gonna be equal to our final temperature minus our initial. So we have 28.49 uh, minus 25.10. Okay, we're gonna plug that into our calculators. That's gonna give us 3.39 degrees C. Okay, so at this point, we have all three variables in order to calculate the Q of our surroundings. Okay, so the stuff that we have measured. Okay, so if we take this, we're going to plug it into the equation here. So Q of H2O is going to equal 50.00 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times our 3.39 degrees C. Okay, plug all that into our calculator and we end up with the following 709.188.
Okay, so we're going to hold off on our rounding, but we're going to mark our significant figures. So we got three and four. Okay, so we're going to mark that. Units wise, grams and grams cancel, Celsius and Celsius cancel, so we're left with joules. Okay, now at this point, guys, we have calculated the um, change in heat of the surroundings. Okay, so it's a positive Q value, so the surroundings have absorbed heat. All right, but we don't really care about the surroundings. We're trying to get information about the solid. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is convert our information about our surroundings uh, and get into the information about our solid. So what we'll do is we'll write the relationship, okay, this equality here, and we will subsequently indicate our value as follows, okay? Now, we have not been asked for the Q of the solid. That's not what they're asking us to solve for. But if we analyze the Q of the solid really quickly, you notice that the Q of the solid is negative. That means that the solid lost this 709.188 joules of heat. It gave it away to the surroundings, okay? So in this situation, we would say that the change that occurs in the solid, which is the system that we're trying to analyze, um, is exothermic, okay? Now, we're not being asked to uh, just give the Q of the solid. They actually want the specific heat capacity of the solid. So we know that our Q of our solid is going to be equal to M times C times delta T. Okay. Now, we are solving for C. Okay. So we're going to manipulate this equation. C is going to equal Q of solid over M times delta T. Okay. And we have the information um, for our solid. Okay, we have all of this information. It's been provided to us, right? So we have our mass of our solid. That's going to be equal to 25.64 grams, okay? Um, our delta T for our solid is going to be the final minus the initial. The final temperature is going to be that same final temperature that the water was at, okay? Because everything's in the same container, so everything exists at the same temperature at the end of the process. So we have 28.4. 4, 9 um, minus what we started at, the initial temperature, which was 100.00 degrees C. Okay, we're going to calculate that. It's going to give us 70, sorry, negative 71.51 degrees C. Okay, and then we're going to plug um, all of this information that we have into our equation here. So our C of our solid is going to equal negative 709.188 joules. Okay, I'm gonna mark that significant digit there. Um, go ahead and plug in our mass value, which is 25.64 grams times the negative 71.51 degrees C. We're gonna plug all this into our calculator. And that's gonna give us 0 0.3867. Okay, um, we have four, three, and four significant digits. So we're going to have three here. So it's going to be 0 0.387. Okay, units wise, joules, grams, um, Celsius, none of them cancel. So joules per gram degree Celsius, which makes sense for our specific heat capacity value. Okay, so what I want you guys to notice here is I first solved for my information about my surroundings with what was provided. I then used my relationship here to get information about the solid. I then manipulated the portion of the um, Q equals MC delta T problem um, that was going to be used to solve for the specific heat capacity of the solid. Um, I wrote out those variables and subsequently solved for the information about um, the specific heat capacity of that specific solid. Now, what you guys should be aware of is that this is a really nice way to figure out um, the identity of your uh, substance, your metal, your solid, okay? Everything has a specific heat capacity, so this could be utilized to figure out the identity of your substance as well. Okay, so this is how you're going to progress through these problems. Now, I could have given you any um, variable to solve for. It didn't have to be C. Um, I could have provided C and asked you about the change in temperature, um, or I could have provided you the change in temperature in C and asked for the mass of the solid. Um, you could have actually been asked to solve for anything um, in these particular problems, okay? But just make sure, guys, that you're using your relationships 
um, and, you know, showing your work.